got to his house. Uh, but you told him, thank you this morning uh, for another day. Amen. Uh, we're in chapter 14, I believe, uh, in our book, Living on the Edge. And uh, we've been dealing with uh, this whole idea of identity. And this, this uh, Wednesday night, the title is, Where Do You Fit in God's Family? Uh, that's a good question, isn't it? Amen. So <clears throat> just to kind of recap uh, real briefly, Paul in Romans, remember he had talked about uh, really to sum up Romans 1 through 11, Paul dealt with doctrine, didn't he? And then what time he got to chapter 12, he uses that word, therefore. And so in light of everything God has done for us, this is what you need to do um, as a child of God. And so what Paul has been getting at is that we need to um, not only be believers, but we need to put that learning into practice. Um, I thought, uh, I know in past I've said that uh, we are a great people of doxology. Uh, we love to praise and worship God. Uh, and we praise him based upon uh, orthodoxy. Amen? Uh, but how are we doing in orthopraxy? Uh, practicing of the doctrine that we believe and we have learned. How well are we doing with that? Uh, because it's insufficient to... Uh, praise and shout and carry on uh, when we're not putting what we've learned into practice. Is this mic on? <laughs> All right. Uh, he wants our doctrine, he wants doctrine to become our duty. Amen? Uh, he wants belief to turn into behavior. And so it should be something that if we are eter internalizing his word and, and what he has said to us, so on and so forth, there should be some outward uh, expression or practice or behavior or conduct because of what we have learned and what we believe. And I have on here, we serve Christ, but we also serve one another because of Christ. And the first illustration we talked about in uh, Romans 12, 1, had to do with what? A living sacrifice. Remember that? And remember I said uh, the problem with a living sacrifice, it had the tendency to get off the altar when it wants to. Uh, that's why it's a daily uh, sacrifice. It's a daily commitment. But here's a different uh, illustration that Paul uses. And he uses this illustration that has to do with members of a body. And this is verses 3 through 8. And so if we looked and kind of summarizes, summarized verses 1 and 2, it has to do with obviously consecration and transformation, right? Uh, and you can use another word instead of consecration, you use dedication. And then verse 3, uh, we've been dealing with the last two weeks, evaluation. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. Amen? And uh, I guess that can be real good and bad. <laughs> uh, we also need to, in verse 3, it talks about humility. And so what Paul is saying by the time he gets to verse 3 and forward, the following verses, he is saying, listen, this is what a transformed life looks like. Okay, and then lastly, therefore, a life dedicated to worship is incomplete if you're not ready and willing to serve your brother or sister in Christ. Amen. Some delayed amens, but I'd take them even if they late. Uh, you, you, your, your, your worship is incomplete. If all you do is worship God, but treat your brother bad. Amen. Uh, true worship shows itself in service, not just lip service. All right? 
All right, we got the hard stuff out the way. And so the first part of the, this particular uh, chapter, Chip talks about his friend. And he alludes to um, that his friend was uh, pretty successful. He's been helpful before. Um, but he is going through something. He's got, a, he's got a problem. He's got a situation. And what is his, his issue? Not sure of where he belongs. Now, my question to you, uh, do you find that uh, fascinating? Why is that? Okay, I, why is that understandable? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Helpful, helpful, yeah, yeah. The the part that uh, that really had me pondering about this is. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume he has a family. So, so how can you have, perhaps I'm not quite sure if he's married, but, you know, siblings or what have you, but how can you have a, a, a family and relationship and still feel the way his friend feels? You ever thought about that? Yeah, uh, and if I had to sum up what you just said, it would be uh, you, you give so much that you are running empty, and you're not a part of anything or around anyone who can help you become replenished. Is that a way to say it? All right. Somebody else said, Brother Quentin, you said something? So, so with family, right, you're saying that you could, you know, um, get after it so much that you can actually lose yourself in that in some kind of way, okay? What else? Because you would assume that the brother would, would get what he needed from his family and would be okay. That makes sense? But... Unfortunately, what he stands in need of, his biological family can't quite provide for him. Why is that? And I, I can, you know what, I can see like a bubble over some of y'all head. And you just like, you know, you know what you want to say, but you, you're afraid to say it. But it's okay. It's cool. You can say it in here. Why, why is that? Yeah. <clears throat> so in a real sense, with your family, uh, you had nothing to do with choosing them, did you? You stuck with them. It, it is what it is. <laughs> but with a church family, you had something to do with that. And ultimately, God had a whole lot to do with that. Does that make sense? And so what you may not be able to find with biological family, with your spiritual family, that's what you need. Ultimately, that's what you need 
to make it from day to day, all right, week to week. And so I kind of want to look at a couple of pictures of this. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the Old Testament book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, and uh, we'll only look at just a few verses here. Um, and we'll start at verse 6. And here is um, kind of the backdrop as you're finding Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, there was a famine in the land. Remember that? And this uh, husband and wife had to leave. And remember the husband and wife's name? Hmm? Mm-hmm. Let me let. Yeah, they had to leave, and they had two boys, right? And so they left, went out to the land of Moab, um, and then those boys end up getting married. And what were the, what were the wives' names? Orpha. Yeah, Ruth and Orpha, right? And so, what tragedy happened? Huh? All the men died in that little small family, right? Um, and so you, it brings you to around chapter, I mean, uh, verse 6. Um, and I'll read verse 6 and 7, then we'll ask for some volunteers. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that, look at this, the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way, returned to the land of Judah. And so Mama, who is who, Naomi, mother-in-law who is Naomi, heard that God had visited the land. So there's restoration and replenishment back home. So I'm going back going back home, right? So what's the dilemma, though? The girls, they're not from, they're not from there. Where is their home? Their home is Moab, right? And so uh, is, are, they, are, are they going with their biological family member? No, right? And so what does Naomi say? Verse, uh, verse 8. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, y'all can go on back home, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant, you, grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. First thing, if I had to uh, talk about Naomi, this is a God-fearing sweet lady. She wants nothing but blessings for these daughters-in-law, right? She's not related to them. She was. Her sons are gone. She wants, the, wants nothing but the best for them. Go on back to your mama's house, right? And they love her so much, the Bible says they started weeping. Then in verse 10, they said to her, no, why don't they want to leave her? There's a relationship, and what indicates to me is that their relationship with her is probably stronger than with their own biological family. And that's what some of y'all wanted to say a while ago, but you wouldn't say it. And Naomi said, return, my daughters, uh, why, why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husband? Return, my daughters, go, I'm too old. And she goes on a list of what I don't have and why you shouldn't be with me. And then one of them ended up saying, okay, I guess I'll go ahead and go to my mother's house. And who was that? Orpha. One decided, no, I'm going to stay with you. And what did she say? And we shout off of what she had to say. What did, what did Ruth say to Naomi? What did she say? Man. There was something about Naomi that Ruth gravitated to and something about her and what she said resonated in her life. And so even though I have family a mile and a half from here, 
You have something that's stronger than what I have biologically. There's something about you and about our relationship that I benefit more than what I do in my mama's house. That is strong to me. And so she said, no, your God is my God. And she says, what else? Wherever you go, I'm going. <laughs> Where you die, I die. I'm, I'm, I'm going with you. Ride or die. Right? Yeah. And we know ultimately that God not only used her, but he blessed her. And we know who her grandson is, right? Who's her grandson? David. Amen. You've been studying. So we see that this spiritual relationship is actually stronger than perhaps her biological relationship. Amen? All right, let's look at... Uh, one more. And again, we're talking about a community of believers. John chapter 20, verse 19. John 20. If you have that, can you read uh, that passage for us? You can keep going. One more. Okay, that, that, that'll work. And so we talked about briefly with Ruth how that, that spiritual relationship uh, was so strong, right? And we're also saying that uh, we thrive better in a spiritual relationship or a spiritual community versus other relationships. Uh, and we look at the life of Ruth, she fit more so with Naomi and what Naomi had than she would have with her own biological family. She fit and belonged with Naomi. Now in this picture in the New Testament, uh, we see uh, a great picture of belonging, but somebody is not where they should be. And when you're not where you should be or where you belong, you actually miss out on things. You, you follow me? And so here we have uh, Thomas Didymus, and Didymus you know, has, you know, has something to do with duality, the twin. He, he has a duality to him. He's, he's sharp and, and, and got some faith on one hand, and then he's kind of trivial and absent and doubtful on the other hand. And so he missed out on a whole lot. Here is this spiritual community, this supernatural community, what Chip Ingram says. And Thomas is not on the scene. He is not where he actually belonged, right? So what are some of the, uh, some of the things he missed out on? Well, he missed the joy of what? And it's right there in verse 20. What did he miss out on? Huh? He missed the, the seeing the Lord. He missed out on that. Now, what do you think, and, and, and perhaps um, uh, you, you, you can't quite imagine this, but what do you think if he would have saw Jesus, how would his life been different around this time of the text, when the upper room? What if he would have saw Jesus? What if he would have been where he was supposed to be, what would happen? Wouldn't have had questions, wouldn't have had doubts, a whole lot of other things. Let's look at one more. 
uh, he, always, he also missed the blank of being with the other disciples in verse 21. What else he missed? Huh? Yeah. Well, when you think about it, and I got on there, comfort, right? When you are going through something, you need other believers to get in there with you. You cannot go at it all by yourself. And so if you look at the, the disciples, he's the only one that's not in this supernatural community where he belongs. But also when you look at, uh, he also missed the master's what? In verse 22 and 23. Hmm? Yeah. He, yeah. And, and you, both right, he missed the large charge in his peace, right? He, you know, Jesus says, peace be unto you. And he gave them a charge. Thomas missed all of that. And so uh, where, where Thomas is, instead of experiencing peace, he's experiencing turmoil. Because he's not in this supernatural community of believers. And then lastly, he missed the blank. He needed to remove blank. He missed what? The evidence that he needed to remove doubt. Right? This spiritual or this supernatural community in this upper room, reminds you of what? Come on, this is a quiz. Somebody get Hmm? Not what, quite what I'm looking for. The church. So when you don't come to the supernatural, uh, spiritual community of God, you will miss out on feeling the presence of the Lord. You'll miss out on the joy and the peace that comes from being in the presence of the Lord and with other believers. And when you're not a part of this supernatural spiritual community, you won't have anything to assist you with your doubts. And so when you kind of paint it that way, you see that there's an actual and absolute need to be where you belong. That makes sense? Because not being there, not only do you miss out on things, but you, you walk around life empty. And that what was wrong with Chip's friend at the beginning of the chapter. Look at a couple of uh, verses real quick. Proverbs chapter 27. Somebody read that, and then somebody read Hebrews chapter 10, verse, uh, verses 24 and 25. Proverbs 27 and 17. So, so how does the other person become sharper? In order, uh, in order to be sharp, you need another person to sharpen you. You see that? And then uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 24, 25. So, so what is the purpose of the assembly in, that, in that, those two verses? Huh? To encourage one another. So if you're not in the supernatural community of God, how can you know what real encouragement looks like? Does that make sense? And then what else is in there in those two verses? You need someone to help you do good deeds. You see that? You need someone to, to stimulate you. That's what my version has. To stimulate one another in love to do good deeds. 
and obviously in the context of that is to do good deeds for the Lord. Amen? And then he says, uh, after he says, not forsaking yourselves, because uh, some people, this is a bad habit. They become accustomed. This is, this is a routine for some people's lives. Uh, but you need to encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is that day drawing near? The Lord coming back. Amen. Return of the Lord. And so this whole supernatural community is the place where we belong, and when we're absent from it, we have gaps and voids in our lives that we cannot fill with anything else. Uh, the second portion, uh, Chip talks about belonging is a God-given need. Uh, we're actually, if you go way back to Genesis and, and just keep going throughout the entire Bible, uh, you'll see that everybody needs somebody else. And we are no different. We're at, God created us like that. He created us uh, for us to have that need for somebody else. And that person has a need and so on and so forth. And Chip talks about how we are interdependent. And we'll kind of talk about that in just a minute. But So why is being a part of this supernatural community of God so important? I got a few things listed. Number one, acceptance. If it is a true supernatural community of God, they will accept me regardless of my past. Amen. Regardless of what I have on. Regardless of what kind of car I drive. Regardless of what kind of house or apartment I live in. Regardless of what I did just yesterday, didn't get no amen. The church is the only organization and organism that God has commissioned and ordained to forgive. And why do we forgive? Because we've been forgiven. Amen. What is the opposite of being accepted? Who is the number one person you can think of who was rejected? Huh? Who was rejected? Who, how was he rejected? <laughs> His own receive him not. And can you think? He was rejected and succumbed himself to be rejected so that this body, this community of believers would accept one another. He endured all that so we didn't have to reject. Now, he, he warned us that the world is going to reject you. But what he said, what I don't want is for you to reject one another. You should accept one another and accept people if they want to be a part of this family. Then the second thing is we're able to cope with painful emotions. Again, there's, and I know, and you might not want to say it, but there's some things I know I've gone through personally that had I not come to church, I would have lost my mind. And I'm just, and I'm being transparent and real. And it wasn't necessarily just the sermon. It wasn't necessarily the, 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 the songs that the choir sung. Sometimes it was just seeing you. And when I think about how you're on the prayer list and yet you're here this Sunday morning or this Wednesday night, and you're giving God the praise, the honor, and the glory that's due his name, that encourages me, and I know it does the same for you. And so not only are we encouraged by the manifestation of God's presence in this place, but we're also encouraged by the presence of one another. And when we're going through painful experiences, being in the community of believers helps us get through those things. Amen? And then lastly, I have on here, 
being a part of this supernatural community of God is so important because it reminds us how valuable we are. The world and this society does a phenomenal job at reminding us through legislation, uh, through uh, laws and uh, society mores and, and rules and so on and so forth, uh, that we're not as valuable as God believes that we're valuable. We see it on media, and we see it in, on television, news, what have you. We hear from our president. We hear all different ways. And we hear all of that junk, but when we come to the house of the Lord, we realize and we're reminded and we are reaffirmed that I am a child of God. And you can't get all of that what you get in here out there. Amen? And so we also realize that we're valuable. Next, he talks about every person has a role to fulfill. And I have that quote here that's on page 135. Uh, he says, operate in interdependent, interdependent unity to accomplish a purpose beyond the scope of any individual part. So the body of Christ is to function as a team or family for the reality of the life of Christ to be manifest to its family and to the watching world. That's a deep statement. That, that, that's, that's loaded with all kind of good stuff. And, and, and the picture that, that the brother is painting, that there is a task or a job or an assignment that exists that has been given to us, and you cannot fully uh, fulfill it by yourself. You follow me? that you are just a member of the body and there's some things you can do, but you can't do everything that is required of the body. That makes sense? And so in order to do those things that are beyond you individually, you need other members of the body to join you so y'all can all get it done together. Amen. And so my question to you tonight, can you fulfill your God-given purpose away from the supernatural community of God? Yes or no? Why do you say that? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's it in a nutshell. So we can get some things done, but we're not going to accomplish what ultimately needs to be accomplished for Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And you're absolutely right. You're not going to be able to do it, but you have to be a part of this community of believers to accomplish what needs to be done. Uh, so he transitions, he talks about purpose, and we're talking about this whole road to fulfill. Uh, and I love the way he dives into what was Jesus' purpose. What was, his, what was his role? What was Jesus' purpose? 
this earthly purpose. What was he here for? Seek and to save those who were lost. And I like it where he even took it a step further. He said, uh, I came to save the sick, not the ones who think they're righteous and got it going on. Because y'all don't need a doctor. But those who acknowledge that they need some help, I'm their help. Um, and what else did he say? What, what else was his, his role and his, his mission? Come on, we're coming up on Easter. Don't mess this one up. Amen. Can she sit in the pulpit, son? Oh. <laughs> he, he was born to die and take away the sins of the world. Amen. That was his role. That was his purpose. And he understood his purpose and, and lived his purpose perfectly. Never got out of step. Never missed a step. He was where he needed to be all the time on time. And when he knew that his appointment to die was coming up, he accepted it. Right? He knew what his purpose was. And in the same way, he wants us to know what our purpose is and for, he wants us to fulfill that purpose. Uh, look at a couple of passages for me. John chapter 10, verses uh, 17 and 18. And look, verse 10 of John chapter 10, verse 17. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. He says, I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my father. And he fulfilled that role and purpose, didn't he? Amen. And then go to Matthew 20, verse 28. Someone read that for me. And to do what? And so what Jesus said that he came to serve, right? And to give his life as a ransom. What does that word ransom mean? It's, a, it's, it's really a powerful and yet gruesome word. It means that somebody has been held captive. And they are in, in an excruciating state, bad predicament, messed up condition. And there's a person willing to buy their freedom. And the root of that word ransom means to give myself in place of that person who is captive. And so what Jesus is saying, that he said, I was, I was made a ransom. He says that I'm going to give my body to free that body. That makes sense? And the only way that body can be freed is I got to lay my body down. But don't worry, I'll take it up again. I can shout off of that. And then lastly, he says, uh, watch out for the comparison game. Now, why do you think we have a tendency to compare uh, with one another? Uh, many members of the body, uh, but yet we have this tendency, if we're not careful, to compare one, an one another with each other. Why do we do that? Hmm? That's one reason. Make yourself look good. Amen. What else? Jealous. Amen. Hmm? 
Yeah. I think I'm better than so-and-so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, again, this whole illustration uh, of body, this metaphor of body, uh, what I think, and I think you're absolutely right, uh, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, uh, to believe that since we are this body part, we're not as valuable as this other body part. And when we do that, we cause division. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and we have to understand that the whole body is just as valuable as all of its members. Every part of your body. Let me ask you this. Is there a body part that you can do without? Huh? You need, <laughs> you need all of it. No, you want all of it, don't you? Yeah. And guess what? If you feel that way about your own physical body, as members, we should feel the exact same way about Christ's body. Amen? That every member and every part of the body is as valuable as the other parts. Now, you got some parts that you don't see. But just because you don't see it don't mean it's not important. Amen? Very important, right? And so, uh, obviously, you know, the Bible used uh, figurative language to talk and describe the body, but I found um, some body parts, what I call obscure body parts, but we, uh, we tend to kind of, well, some of us, devalue them because we don't think they're as major and important as the other body parts. So I got on there, eyebrows. Now, it's, the eyebrows are, are not just for uh, uh, you know, tweaking. What, what do y'all call them? Arching. They're not just for arching. But do you know why God gave us eyebrows? Keep the dust out, bacteria out of our eyes, uh, all this crazy stuff that, that can impact us and get us sick. God said he put these up here to protect us. Intelligent designer. So if you are eyebrows, you actually are watching out for the eye. So don't be jealous of the eye. You keep an eye on the eye. <laughs> you with me? And then... Uh, cuticles. We 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 don't we don't too much pay much. To, I know women do, but most of us don't. We don't pay too much to cuticles. But you know why God gave us cuticles? If you didn't have that little cuticle right there, as much work as you do with your hands, bacteria will get in your hands and cause an infection. So you're complaining that you are a cuticle, but you're protecting the body. You feeling me? And then I got a good one. Uh, who in here is a tragus and an anti-tragus? <laughs> a tragus and an anti-tragus. Huh? You not, don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a part of your ear. So that little um, uh, hard part, that cartilage part of your ear, one's a tragus and one is an anti-tragus. And what it does is it helps curb sound so that this part right here helps you understand what's coming behind you. And this part right here helps you understand what's coming in front of you. So if you didn't have those, you wouldn't be able to hear folks behind you. And they talking about you like a dog. And then folks in front of you, they talking about you in front of your face, and you wouldn't be able to hear them. Now, if you are an anti-tragus and tragus, you ought to praise God. Because we need you to help us hear what we need to hear. Even though they are obscure body parts, they are all functioning and important to the overall health of the body. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Somebody read that and we'll close out.
Amen. And that's a really, really deep verse, and we'll talk about it a little bit next week. But Paul talks about how the body is fitted perfectly together uh, to fulfill its purpose where it is. And he talks about now we are the body, but the body also has a head, and his name is who? Jesus Christ. And the body is not supposed to do anything that the head didn't tell it to do. If, 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 if your hands or your arms just start doing stuff, you know they, they, they put you away for that kind of stuff. And they put you on medication and, and, and lock you up and we got to come see you and I got to do the prison ministry again and all that kind of stuff. And so it's supposed to do what the head tells it to do. Just like the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, and we're supposed to do what the head tells us to do. And we're supposed to appreciate that the head put whatever member of the body you are, puts you where he wanted you to be because there is an important, valuable purpose that you need to fulfill. Amen? Amen. Any uh, questions or, or comments on tonight's lesson? All right. God bless you. We'll go ahead and take up uh, an offering tonight.